Everybody, it's great to be back here again tomorrow. It's Friday, Parsha Shoftim. We are moving forward towards the new year. Um, this week in Israel, it's, it's unbelievable how there's always things in the portion again and again that are always hinting to events that are going on. And I'm not going to go today in all the in details of what happened, but this week we had an issue with the Attorney General of the past and a lot of corruption. Unfortunately, unfortunately um, there's too much corruption what goes on in a system, that the existing system, the judicial system of Israel. And this, before the war that took place on October 7th, there was a tremendous um, calling from, you know, from the new elected government to make changes in the judicial system in order to make Israel a more democratic country. And unfortunately, uh, right away, the um, progressive liberal side of the picture are very concerned that they're very happy that the ones in power are progressive liberals, so they want to maintain um, in a dictatorship, maintain the situation, not allow changes to be made naturally by a, a country that is growing and changing. And um, it's the logical thing, of course, to allow, to be democratic, allow such changes, but they're holding on to the altar, as they say, we're not letting go. And, um, and this is a major issue, and then came the terrible tragedy of October 7th, and everything was put on hold. Um, right now we're dealing with other issues, and of course the lack of unity amongst Israel is, brings about so many of these tragedies, as we all know. But we can't um, bury the, the necessity, the great need for these judicial changes. And obviously they're, they're just beginning, just, you know, the, just beginning to make some changes that they want to do. There's a lot of more things that eventually we'll, go, we'll talk about it today, what we are obviously hoping to see um, in our lifetime take place in the land of Israel. We know what's going to take place, but we're hoping to see major changes in our judicial system, in our whole system of Israel, um, take place in the future, which we, we are promised by our prophets that these changes will take place. But it's a process, as we know. Together with that, this week's portion, I want to focus on this, but we'll touch upon the other topic a little bit, and I want to focus on leadership, because one of the, um, obviously, one, another great topic of, of concern, discussion in all countries, is their leadership of the country, right? the government that runs the country. And in Israel, um, it was a, there was the right wing, um, won the elections in a democratic fashion, obviously, with 64 seats in the parliament, and Netanyahu is the leader of that, and that's fine, right, as far as democracy works, but there are people that are challenging his leadership and are constantly doing anything they can to try to dethrone Netanyahu. And we see, we saw this week when he spoke to the, um, he spoke to Israel, he spoke to the country after the terrible murder. I mean, we've, we've seen, what, we don't need any more proof of the, the evil, subhuman monsters that these Hamas are. But we saw another testimony to this just a few days ago when, when Hamas murdered the six, six captives. Um, so anyway, Netanyahu spoke to Israel to try to set things straight. Why is he holding on to the Philadelphia route, not, a, not, not willing to get to budge an inch over there, which obviously, if anyone has any foresight, we saw what happened in the past, how it became a free, a totally free, Super highway <clears throat> of smuggling weapons in from Egypt right across the border into the land of Israel. <clears throat> this was going on for 20 years. Not to mention it's happening in other parts of Judea and Samaria. So Israel's got to put its, you know, put say enough as enough and stop this madness. And Netanyahu spoke very well and w with great leadership and explained why he's extremely um, not going to budge on this matter, although he's loosened his. His grip on a lot of other things, which are very questionable, as we all know, but but whatever it is, the Hamas are just not budging because they know when they see a disunity in the country, they see that everyone comes against the Netanyahu, they want they make a major strike, striking the country um, in protest against real political strike, which um, totally illegal, of course, but this is what they allow themselves to do. So it gives strength to the enemy, and the enemy is strengthened. Why should he budge in his demands? So, so all these, you know, this progressive liberal ways are causing the enemy to strengthen his grip and not give in in any way. 
and, um, and therefore it's making the hostages wait longer to get out of the terrible situation. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a nightmare. We haven't forgotten it was going to be a year soon. But um, so these discussions about leadership, about um, democracy, and about our judicial system, these are the topics of our portions. And this portion I want to focus today on, particularly on, on a king, understanding the, the concept of what is a king in Israel. And let's read, let's, we'll, we'll read about this a little bit here and, and begin the conversation, the discussion. It says in, in um, our portion, in chapter 17, verse number 14, it says, Ki tavo el aretz. When you shall come to the land, Asher Hashem elokecha noten lach. The land which God gave you, v'yerishta v'yeshavta ba, and you inherit the land, and you will dwell in the land, and it says, and you will say, Asima alai melech And you begin, so in, in other words, the Torah is telling us, is explaining a scenario when you come to the land, what it will come to be, that you'll enter the land of Israel. And then a time will come and you'll say, you want a king like the nations around us. So verse number 16, 15 says, You shall surely place surely put in place a king um, that God will choose, amongst your brothers. Okay, and then it goes on to discuss um, limitations of, of the power of the king, what he shouldn't do, because the king, obviously, the Torah is talking about, obviously, a righteous leadership. Um, he says he shouldn't have horses, too many horses, right, overdo it with horses and overdo it um, with wives and overdo it with money, and another thing, after it's limited his materialistic um, wealth and all those things that he's going to amass to himself, um, the Torah says he should write a Torah. He should write the Torah. Um, he has to write a Sefer. And this Torah that he's writing a scroll, He's going to, it's going to be with him his entire life in order that he learns to fear God and to, and to watch over the entire Torah. Okay? Um, so we see here, the, right away, the Torah the commands, um, the, the, makes the command of having a leadership of a king. Right away, it's giving, um, it's telling that it must be done with, it must be done with, um, Obviously, through God choosing, and someone has to be God fearing, and all the, in all these, in all this, um, you know, all the things that we mentioned, has to be something a person who's very God fearing, etc. And watching over, you know, watching the Torah and fulfilling all the commandments. That is, that's a basic understanding of what a king has to be done. But here, the question comes up, and I want to get into the discussion here: Is is a king necessary? Should, must we have now? What is a king? Is a monarchy, right? A king is a monarchy. In other words, it's like a certain form of, um, you could say, dictatorship, one, a leadership of one individual. That seems a little, in today, in modern times, it's, um, it, there are countries in the world that are dictatorships, that have a king. Um, and we know that mo- all these situations where there's one leader, it's a lot of corruption going on. And the system, the, the democratic system, is, seems to be a lot more um, fair, and, you know, and it's, it seems to be a much, much more honest way of running the show. So the fact that the Torah is calling for a monarchy, but a monarchy with limitations of, of someone God-fearing and, and putting limitations on it, but nevertheless the question is, is this a, a, a commandment of the Torah? Is the Torah saying, when you enter the land of Israel, the government, you know, the desired government you have to set up is a monarchy? And that will go into eventually. Will eventually happen. It must happen, as another any other commandment of the Torah. Right. So you can say right now, according to this understanding, that the fact that the, the government we have is a democratic parliament government, that eventually will take will will put, put um, push itself aside for the monarchy form of government. Um, is that the understanding of the Torah here? Just like as we know, you know, there's this Jewish um, system of courts, but the court system in Israel today. We need much more than a reform. Eventually, we have to move it over totally to a, a Jewish court, right? A Sanhedrin, and all, with all the, the way it was for, for time and memorial for the people of Israel. So is that, that same thing a requirement amongst the leadership of Israel? The form of government we have, that's a great question we have to ask. 
And what's really fascinating, we see there are three different approaches amongst our um, sages. And we'll begin, I want to show, because it's very interesting, if we look in this particular verse in, in, in chapter 17 here, it seems like it's a positive commandment, Som Tasim Alecha Melech. Well, you shall appoint a king. It seems like God's telling us right now we must do this. On the other hand, I want to first, before we get to the other um, directions, I want in the, the different directions of explaining this whole thing, I want to look in the book of Samuel in chapter 8. In the book of Samuel 1, chapter 8, on um, verses 1, you know, the whole chapter is important to read, but we're not going to read it all now. But there, the, the, the Bible talks about when Samuel was, was, became old, and his children were placed as, as um, judges of Israel, and his children didn't go in his way. So the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came before Samuel, in, in where, he was, where he lives, in, where he lived in, in Ramot or Ramah. And they came before him, they said, Behold, you know, you're, old, you're old now, and your children are not following your ways. And they said, Make, Bring a king over us to judge us, like all the nations. And, and, then, and, and this was when, when Samuel heard this request of Israel, right away his heart fell, and he said, and he felt terrible. When they said, give us, a, give us a king to judge us, and he, Shmuel prays to God, and God answers Shmuel, and he says to him, listen to the word of the nation, what they tell you. Because they did not despise you, they despised me for being king over them. Okay, so here we see, and, and we have to, um, right away, when we, we look at these verses in Samuel, we see for sure that the, the impression we're getting here is that the appointment of a king is something that is not wanted, really. And it's, in a way, it's a despise, despising the spiritual leadership, despising God, and despising Samuel the prophet, but it wasn't something that it seems like a necessity, a positive commandment. It just seems something that you're allowed, God allowed to happen, but not to be, um, you know, not to be, to command Israel to do so. So how does that work together with what we're reading in, in our portion where it says, you shall surely place a king upon you. But what's interesting, in the book of Deuter um, Deuteronomy, in our portion, the first verse in 14, it says, and you will say, I want a king. So in other words, it seems to be a mixture there, like only if you, as the people of Israel, come together and say, oh, we want a king, then God says, appoint a king. So it could really fit very well with Samuel, if we understand it that way, because the first verse in 14 sounds like it's something that you're not required to do, but you, it's a, you're allowed to do so, because it says, and you will say, I'll place a king. In other words, it's coming from you. So here, again, the question is, are these contradictory um, areas, these two portions, or they're, or they're complementing one another? So, of course, we have to make peace between them because they know that the Torah is, is one unit and we have to understand it, and it teaches many different directions. We have to try to come to an understanding here. Now, that's the other thing. And now, I want to bring, before we get to the to the um, continuation here and try to get to the different opinions of understanding this whole concept. <clears throat> I would like to bring down just quickly, we all know, I doesn't even mention it, not to bring down verses so much, but we know that the, our prophets talk about the future. And in the future we know that there will be a king again in Israel, the, you know, Melech HaMashiach, the Messiah, which will be a king. And therefore, for sure, we're talking about a one-man show, right? A, a, lead, a great leader of Israel will come about in the future. And it's, as we can mention, the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, it says, um, in the end of days, when the temple will be established on, on the mountain, it says, Nachon yehal beit Hashem, berosh harim, right? The, be established on the, on the mountains, the, you know, the... Um, and it will be uh, exalted amongst all hills. It's talking about Jerusalem being rebuilt. And nations will come streaming into Israel. 
and they will say, let's go up, because El Harashel, let's go to the mountain of God, the house of Jacob, and let him teach us of his ways. And we will follow his ways, because Torah will come out of, because from Zion, the Torah will come forth in the word of God from Jerusalem. So it says, right after that, in verse 4, Vishafat ben Agoyim. And then he will judge between the nations. Here it's referring to the king of Messiah that will judge the nations. And he will bring um, reproof to the nations. And then we will have a situation where Vikitetu Chavotam Litim. And they will turn their swords into, into the plowshares and, and, and their spears into pruning, pruning, um, pruning shears, or if you call them pruning, <laughs> pruning device. So what happened, this, this, these future verses of Messiah um, talk about a one-man show, a king. So wait a second. If a king is something that is wanted, you know, why was it despised in Samuel? And we see at the end of days that, obviously this is just one verse I brought down. Of course, we have many verses in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel talk about it. One king over, there will be one united king over Israel. <clears throat> I'm not going to bring all those verses down now. Maybe we'll see some more at the end. So we have to understand, how does that fit in the picture? Because there, if we say the whole concept of, of having a king was despised in Samuel, why would it be wanted at the end of days? But the answer is obviously, the answer to the question, I think, become obvious when you think about it in death. But before we get there, I want to show you three approaches in the concept of understanding the verses. And, and the first approach will begin with, um, you know, you know, there's so many to choose from, I don't know where to begin, but I think I'll start from the Talmud. It's the best place to start from the Talmud, right? Because the Talmud, um, those are the most ancient sources, will begin there and then work our way up to the Rishonim. So if we look at the Talmud, brought down in the Tractate of Sanhedrin in page 20b, so Rabbi Yudha says in the name of Shmuel, everything that's mentioned um, in the portion of Samuel, which talks about all the things that a king could do, a king is allowed to do so. That's what Rabbi Yudha says in the name of Shmuel. Rav Amar, but Rav says, another Amora, it's only mentioned to, to place fear upon them. As it says, you shall place a king upon you. In other words, that his fear should be upon you. So we see here right away um, the license for a king to go about and do all those things is under a disagreement. If it's, if it's just mentioned to scare people, to give, them, to give them the fear of a king, or they can really actually behave like dictators in a way. And the Talmud goes on to say that this, is, this particular scenario, argument, is an argument that was brought down earlier amongst our Tanaim, not only amongst the Amoraim, ki Tanai. Rabbi Yossi, melech melech Rabbi Yossi says, everything that was said in the portion of the king, the king's allowed to do so. And Rabbi Huda and the Tana Rabbi Huda says, lo um, so, was only, only mentioned in order to threaten again and not really for the purpose of really going ahead and doing it, okay? Now the Talmud continues, and I'm going to continue with a little bit of the Talmud, then we're going to bring down the Gishonim and wrap this all up. And we know Rabbi Yudah says, Shalosh mitzvot nitzavu Yisrael bechnisatan na'aretz. Rabbi Yudah said there were three commandments that Israel was commanded to do so on entering the land of Israel. What were the three law things they must do? Lamid le melech to appoint a king, to wipe out the seed of Amalek. And the third commandment was to build the temple of Notlem Beta Bichira. So Rabbi Yudha says the three commandments are the cardinal commandments of entering the land is king, setting up a king, um, wiping out the enemy of Amalek, and building the, the temple. Rabbi Nohorai Omer, and another um, Tanakh says, the whole concept of setting up a king is only against complaining. In other words, if Israel is, is, is bickering and they're complaining, they want a king like the nations, as it says, and he's quoting, he's quoting our portion, 
where it says, and you will say you want a king. So in other words, the fee, the, according to the understanding of Rav Nohorai, it's not a commandment to appoint a king, but it's something that is in our, you know, we have the, we have the permission to do so, but we don't have to do so. So we see the, the actual question of, of is a king a mitzvah, is a positive commandment, or is something that is, could be done if you want, you know, if you really, if Israel wants it, is under a disagreement over here. Now, okay, we'll continue going on over here. Now, the, the, the Gemara goes on to say, there was a bright that brought down that Rabbi Leezer says, Zkenim kehogen shalom. He's talking about the generation of Samuel. And he's saying, if we pay attention to the book of Samuel, chapter 8, we see that there are two, there are two different um, approaches, two different groups that are approaching Samuel. One of them is the elders, and the elders are the ones that first came over to him. And when they asked for a king, and, and, he's, and Rabbi Eliezer says that the elders, they, they had the right, you know, they were motivated for the right reasons. Kehogen shalom. When they said, because they said, give us a king to judge us. They were looking for judgment. They were looking to be, have honest judges. Aval ame aretz, but the ame aretz, the simple people, um, the younger generation, they're the ones who kill, kill they sin. Because they said, we want, we want a king like all the nations. So it's very interesting. According to Rabbi Leza, he's distinguishing, which gives us, of course, another direction of understanding this whole thing. He's saying that it depends. That we can, this is an answer that we'll see later that Maimonides brings down, is that we see that it's all about the approach, what your, motiv- what your motivation is. And if you're motivated for, for good reasons, so then it would have been a, a, a great thing. But if you're not, you're motivated for the wrong reasons, so then it was something that was not really wanted, as we see Samuel, um, and, and, and Samuel right away was so, so hurt that God tells him they despised me, don't worry about it, he calms him down. But we see it was something of some kind of rebellion against the, spirit, the spiritual, um, a rebellion against spirituality, against the living a proper life. They wanted more like a secular kind of leadership. But if it was done for the right reasons, it would have been something worthy. Okay, but we still have to ask the question, if it would have been something worthy, is that the only um, possibility of having a king or not, right? So we surely have to, uh, this question, it becomes very, very important. And not only that, we all know in historical things, we know that eventually when the king came about, it started with King Saul and later on with King David. And of course, King David is the, from his um, seed, later will come Messiah from, out, of, out, of his, out of his seed. So King David, obviously, we can't say he wasn't wanted, right? God chose King David. But the question is, if it could have been different, right? It could have been different. And, um, and that's really, we're going to go and now see, we're going to see other um, <clears throat> commentators, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more detail. Now, I first want to bring down Maimonides, because Maimonides' words are very famous, and everyone, everyone has probably read them somewhere or have heard them in the past, perhaps. Maybe not. Let's read the words of Maimonides. Amanis brings down in the laws of kings. What does he say? He says, um, he says like this, Shalosh mitzvot There are three commandments that Israel was commanded to do so when they entered the land. And one of them was lemanot lehem melech, to appoint a king. So the Rambam right away, Amanis, in his the laws of kings, chapter one, um, law number one, he says, it is a positive commandment to appoint a king. And then he talks about destroying Amalek and building the temple. So these are the three commandments that are vital in the land of Israel. Um, and then the Rambam talks about the order of things, what comes first. And he talks about in law number two, First we appoint the king, and then we go after Amalek, and then after Amalek, we can build our temple. So there, he brings and he brings proof down from the Talmud. There are other sources regarding that. The Ramam says in law number three that we don't appoint a king only through the court of a Beitin of 71 elders. So we need an, uh, 71 elders of a Sanhedrin to appoint a king. And in addition, the Ramam says, Valpinavi, and also we need a prophet. It seems like the words of, of the Rambam teaching us 
that there are two requirements. We need the Sanhedrin and we also need a prophet. It doesn't, it doesn't look like he's saying this or that. It seems like he's saying they're both required. And Ki Yoshua Sheminahu Moshe, and he gives an example, just like Joshua, that Moshe Rabbeinu was the king and he appointed Joshua. And um, together with Moshe Rabbeinu's court. So it's very clear that the Rambam requires both. Uki and the same thing, the Rambam mentions King Saul that, and King David that Samuel appointed them together with his court. So we see here from the, word, the words of Maimonides very clear um, that appointment of a king is something that is a law, is a positive commandment, and has to be done, of course, through the, the channels of the spiritual leadership of Israel, the court, the Sanhedrin, and the, <clears throat> and the prophet of the time. And he brings that, of course, Sources that that um, strengthen that approach, um, which he said, which he shows Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu appointed Joshua, and Samuel um, appointed um, Saul and David. Okay, with, so that's the approach of the Rambam. But I want to show you there are a couple of other approaches, which is very interesting to see, and then I want to bring you a middle a middle approach, which is really interesting. So um, first, I'll just mention the Ibn Ezra comes down and says, "Som tasim, you shall appoint a king." He says right away. This is the other approach. Rishut. He said it's not an op- a positive commandment, but it's a, it's something. There are certain commandments in the Torah. For example, a person is not commanded to eat meat, but if we eat meat, we're commanded to to slaughter the animal in a kosher way. But if we choose to be a vegetarian, we have no problem with that, right? We don't have to eat meat. So, therefore, the same way the Ibn Ezra says, he says in one word, Rishut, appointing a king is something that is not an obligation. If you, if you do it, then you have to do it the right way. Letting God choose, do it through the, you know, do it through the proper channels. And he says, and he says, um, So he says, very interesting, he says, or a prophet, through the prophet, or through the, we know, the Urim Bitumim, which was on the breastplate of the high priest. He had the stones and they asked questions. He says that's, so he mentioned that's the way that it should be done. He doesn't mention the court itself, but he mentions the Uri Vitumi. So it's similar to Maimonides in that way, that it's required you have to have the spiritual leadership, of course, endorse it. Of course, it, it, it comes right out of the Torah that God says that God will choose. How will God choose? According to Maimonides, it's the prophet. According to the Benesha, it's the prophet that, that's connected to God, that knows what God wants. And of course, the, the Maimonides adds an additional thing, it's the court itself um, obviously agrees on it because they know what God, they're high spiritual rabbis in the highest level, and they're spiritually connected, and many of them are prophets, right? So many of them are very, know exactly what God wants. So it all fits together in the way it's chosen. But the Ibn Ezra says it's something that's not a requirement. And that differs from Maimonides. Um, we'll see one other, one other opinion now, which is about you know, who actually the who's the one who appoints the king, the Nachmanides, he brings down in his explanation, he says, like this, he says, <clears throat> he says, according to our sages, he says it's a positive commandment that we're obligated to do so, like Maimonides. So Nachmanides is similar to Maimonides in that way. Um, after we inherit the land and settle the land, he's saying a positive commandment, like you shall put a fence on your roof. And so, so the Ramban is hinting to the question. The previous verse says, you will say, let's place a king, which seems like it's not an, a positive commandment, but something that you could choose to do if, you're, if you want to. So saying, what we learn from that is that when you appoint a king, it has to come through the proper channels. So he says a very interesting. The word amaltia means you have to actually say it from your mouth. You have to say it to the priests, the Kohanim and the, prof- and the, and the Levites and the judge. So here he's, asking, he's, add, he's adding another element that it's the priests and the judge, right? So it's similar to Maimonides again and Ibn Ezra. They are turning to the, the spiritual leadership. And here is, because we know usually the priests and the Levites are also prophets, or, and the Shafet, they're also part of the Sanhedrin, so it all can sort of fit together. And you will tell them you want 
we, we, we want a king. So the word Vamalta means there's a special element, a part of this commandment to, to say it with your mouth, we want a king, we want a king, you know. So that's how it seems to come out of the words of Nachmanides. But now I want to bring down a totally uh, different approach because we saw until now um, it's a positive command to do so. But now let's quickly look at another approach. And I'd like to bring down the Sfono. The Sfono, I'm not going to bring the Albabanel, which the Albabanel is the same opinion as the Sfono, but the Sfono is much more, much more concise, but says the same thing. Maybe a couple of words of the Sfono, of the Albabanel we can see, but the Sfono says like this, Svona says something very interesting is that when, when the Torah says the, um, when you say you want a king like the nations so the Svona explains what is unique, what is, what is special about the, the kings amongst the nations it usually works that they hand down the monarchy to their children. It's, it, it's, it's something that goes in the, in the family. It's a family inheritance that continues all the generations down. So the Svono says, no, that is what you're, that's what they're, you know, when they ask for that, like the nations. So God says, um, that's, so he goes on to say like this, not like we had the period of the judges when it was, the judges came about, they were a judge, but it didn't, they didn't pass it on to their children. And not, it, wasn't, it didn't happen that the judge's son had to be the next judge. No. Someone who was worthy of being the next judge became the judge, but not, it wasn't something genetic, inheritance. So he goes on to say, He goes, when we came to the land of Israel, he says, we were commanded to appoint judges over us. This is how he explains it. You don't want Israel to be without a leadership. So you need spiritual leadership. So he's saying we're commanded to have judges. Now when he says the word judges, he means not something that's going to be inherited again through the DNA, you know, from father to son. He says, but when you have this, the way, the Gentile way of passing it down from father to son, he's saying that is something that is despised in God's eyes. So he's saying, the, the Torah here, and it's a really very fascinating explanation, he's saying it's not a commandment to appoint a king, but the Torah is actually taking into consideration the psychic of, a, of, of the nature of, of people. And when your people, of course the Torah is prophetic and knowing what's going to be in the future, um, hint to the times of Samuel <laughs> and Israel's going to come over and say we want a king like the nations so then the Torah is going to say okay you, you want a king it's, I'm not thrilled about the request but we'll do it at least the way I want you to do it and therefore it has to be someone that God chooses so it has to be done through the proper channels the prophet someone that God chooses but in reality it's not the ideal situation the ideal situation is the one is, is, is a leadership of like a shofet someone who's worthy because of his spirituality and not because of his family lineage. So that's what he says, and he, and he actually goes on to say, and he, he brings a connection with this, with the law of um, what we saw with the Eshet Yifatoa, when someone goes into battle and they see a beautiful woman, and the Torah allows the person to actually marry this Gentile woman after she converts, of course, and all that because of the because the person was enticed, the soldiers were enticed in battle, so the Torah allows for it to happen. But the Torah warns us the dangers of such a thing, and we saw, and he brings down an example of what happened to Av Shalom, the son of David, who rebelled against his own father because, um, you know, as a result of King David having, the, the Talmud talks about that he had um, many photo or women in battle that he took in battle. But anyway, the, the point that Svon is bringing down very clearly is that the leadership of Israel should not be through a monarchy. It should be through a spiritual leader, Shofet, and not passed down like, so he said, but he's specifically pointing to being inherited down the line with, according to the father to the son, 
You're saying that's not the way? Appointing a king in that fashion is, is despised. But obviously we need, it can't be a vacuum, we need some kind of leadership. So we're talking about a spiritual leadership, a, a shofet, he calls it a judge. Someone who's going to judge, right? Make the proper judgment of Torah, according to Torah law, according to Torah values, that's what he's looking for, the Svarno. In the same lines, <clears throat> I mentioned to you is the line of the, Babanel speaks in a very similar fashion, and he talks about it a little differently. He talks about, he sort of adopted the democratic way. <clears throat> Babanel lived, you know, in the, he was in um, Spain, and, you know, Portugal, and he was, during the time of when the Jews were thrown out by Ferdinand and Isabella, and he was, he was in the politics and the government, he knew a lot about, about being a um, governor and governing, and as we call Medina'i in Hebrew, um, and he he view, he saw the the um, monarchy as a problematic system, and he adopted more of the democratic system, saying that it's a good thing that that leadership changes over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was a similar kind of path as the Sforno, but again, the Sforno is very exact. He's saying a one man show is not a problem, but it has to be a one man spiritual show, but not. A, not the form of a king like the nations passing it down without any distinction who, you know, doesn't care what your son is like. But that's more of his direction here. But the Abel is something more expanding and more even. And, but it could, of course they could connect well, connect together as well. And that was, so two different directions, an extreme. The Ramam says you must point the king, da, da, da. And here we see those ways, the king is not, a, it's not the most desired thing. It's something that if you know choice, appoint the king, all right? Like, uh, we have no choice, they want it, okay, just like the, the woman in, in, in battle, Eshe Yifatol, and this is the direction of the Abel and the Sforna. It's a beautiful explanation, I want to give the last um, explanation that, that combines them both, you could say perhaps, it's a little different, but it's, it's very unique, it's a really original explanation by the Amek Dava, by the Nitziv of Elosh. and the Nitziv, he says something really very interesting. And he says that, well, I'll just try to summarize it, is that leadership, right? It is something, you know, the way countries run, the kind of leadership we have of a country, is very individual. And it depends on the people. Because certain countries need a monarchy. You know, it's something that, right, he doesn't use the words need, they mean, but it's like, it's like a, you know, if you look at a ship without a leader, right? Um, so he says there are certain countries without a king they're going to they're going to drown in the sea. They they need a king. They need a very strong, tight leadership. And on the other hand, the other countries will fall apart if you have one one rule, one dictator that's, that's in charge of everything. So he's saying this is the kind of law that you. The reason the first verse in fourteen says, and you will say you want a king like the nations. The reason you have your say in the matter is because it's something that has to come from the people. You can't have just say appoint a king without forcing it on. Why you force it on the nation? Why can you force a, a, a king on the nation? Because the type of government he's saying is something that literally touches upon pikuach nefesh, a life-threatening situation. And we know in a life-threatening situation pushes aside positive commandments of the Torah. The, you know, and, you know, we all know when it's a life-threatening situation, even negative commandments are pushed away. You know, if a person God forbid, is in a life-threatening situation. You could, um, um, it's certain, you have to sometimes do things on the Sabbath, you know, any kind of medical treatment or, or what necessary to do on the Sabbath even is pushed aside the Sabbath to save a life. So the same way here, we can't appoint a king if it's going to cause, um, God forbid, terrible, terrible trouble in the nation. So if you can appoint a king and then people are going, it's going to cause riots and, and trouble and all kinds of things, it, 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 then it would be pushed aside, pointing a king. So it has to come from the people, that this is what they need, this is what the nation of Israel needs. The country needs this kind of government, and they're satisfied with the government, so that will then become, then will become the, the commandment to do so. So it's really a fascinating explanation. You have to see his words inside, the Nitziva Velazhin, and he explains it. So obviously his idea, the ideal situation, um, he doesn't say it's not a commandment to appoint a king. It's a special kind of mitzvah that it becomes a positive mitzvah, when it's the will of the people. So it's a really interesting combination. But I suggest you see it. Now, with, with these three opinions, then we have to, of course, talk about the end of days of the Messiah. What's going to be when the, when, the, when the one king comes back? And you know, we talk about the, 
eventually there'll be one great king over Israel, as, the, as we brought down different verses before. I just mentioned a couple, but um, we know it's mentioned in many sources in the Torah, that eventually the Messiah will, will be um, a king over Israel. Prophecy will return, the Maimonides talks about it. So how do we, how do we understand this? And, and the answer is very, very um, simple, if you think about it. Of, I think if we look at the words of this forum, it becomes very clear. Uh, the, the king of Messiah is going to be in the, more like a judge in the fact that his whole direction is going to be through his spiritual, great spiritual level. If we think about it, Moshe Rabbeinu, right, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, was a king, correct? He was like a king. He, he was a one-man show, basically. He had his assistants with his court that he put, his, his brother, sister, he had his assistants. But Moshe Rabbeinu was obviously like a king um, in that way. And um, the same thing regarding Joshua, the leader that took over Moshe Rabbeinu. So he's a combination of many things, the prophet together with the king, together with, you know, well, he had, well, he had his court, but he was a really, in one, in one way you could say it's a one-man show, him and Joshua and Moshe Rabbeinu. And it continued in the period of the, of the judges came along. When they, when they led Israel, it was a spiritual leader, for a different times, a different certain times it was for forty years. The land was quiet in the period of judges later on. But when the nation finally, in the times of Samuel, came and required and requested a king, right there, it was the reason that there was such a re harsh reaction. We could say um, on part of Samuel and God um, substantiated that was the fact that they wanted a, 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 a leadership, but not like. They, they wanted to turn away from the spiritual side of the leadership. So, obviously, according to, if we take this direction, and talk about the end of days, realize at the end of days, the situation where there will be one king again, as we had in the time of the leadership, like Moshe Rabbeinu or, or Joshua, so that situation will return, right? But no one questioned, no one questioned the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu or Joshua was our leader, there were, there, there were no questions regarding if that was the right thing or that they, they were the great prophets that were chosen because of their great spirituality and who they were. And this kind of leadership will return in the, in the, in the end of days. And therefore, there'll be no question regarding, in all opinions, whether we go by the opinion of the Ramam, that's a mitzvah of the king, and, and therefore, there'll be a king of Messiah who will be king, or we even go to the opinion of those who are saying it depends on the nation, how the nation can handle the government kind of thing. But in that situation, the, it, could be one, it could be a leader of a parliament also. But that leader will be so, such a high spiritual level and so loved by the people and that there wouldn't be, there will always be some kinds of weak pockets of resistance, perhaps. But the majority, the far majority, um, will see the greatness and the spirituality in that leader, the, the modesty of that leader. And that will overshadow everything. And that's really what we're going to say in the, the King of Messiah, what a true King of Israel is all about. King David was on that level. King David, when he was chosen, and afterwards, first the nation, don't forget, they chose, they wanted a king, so first Saul, because then first Saul was picked. But in reality, um, we also can look at that whole scenario. Saul wasn't even from the house of David yet. So when God later on chose David, the whole fascinating way, when the whole story of Goliath and David... You know, later on, when, when David began to threaten Saul, I mean, not, he didn't threaten him, but Saul was threatened by him, he began to reveal his great special qualities that God chose, who, who eventually from his seed will come, you know, the, the king of Messiah. So this, you know, this, the, the concept we're learning here now is that the spiritual leadership of Israel, when that is the, the reason that there's a necessity for all you know, for you can say these governments and the democracy and all these kind of things we have, is because a one leader system is frowned upon because of corruption and all that. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have to look too far. Um, what's going on in the world? But when a true leader, that is his entire body and soul, is 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 speaking the word of God and and everything about that person is just to do goodness and to do help in the world. No one's going to want anything else. It's going to, it'll be so clear that this is exactly that, um, what God wanted, you know, and the, the chosen one, that this is what God wants. 
and everyone will be so satisfied there will be no questions regarding um, if he's worthy or not worthy and there will be no arguments anymore on, the, on accepting that leader. And now we're in a world, a situation of where we see so many arguments, so many disagreement, because, you know, and, and then, you know, I want to say Bibi Netanyahu is, today is the, the king of Israel, our leader. He's a, you know, he's a great man in many ways. He did so many fin- amazing things and he's doing amazing things, holding on. But still, he's lacking, of course. Um, unfortunately, you know, he's not a man of, of, of God-fearing person, of following, you know, Sabbath observing, following the Torah. Um, that kind of leadership is something that you know, we all lack the word. People are afraid today in Israel, they're all afraid. Oh, it's going to be, or, and they call it a, a country of halakha, of Jewish law and all that. They're afraid of that, the progressive liberals. But in reality, when, when, when a true leader of, of such modesty and, and piety and spiritual, in every way, you know, he'll have the good, the good parts of all leaders in the past and um, putting on that the whole spiritual side, adding it as the most important part. And when, when the word of God is coming out of his mouth and, and, and prophecies in the land, there'll be no questions of what a leader anymore is about. Everyone will be, will understand at that moment that this is what, this is what, is it, this is a true leader. And we're looking, we're praying for those days to come, you know. And right now, as we go through the war in, in Israel and all the trouble in the world, but we're heading for great, great days ahead of us. And we have to hold on tight and they will come. But anyway, this was a little thing to clarify. There's a lot more to study here, just to open up, you know, just to open up our hearts to understand, to think a little bit about this topic. It's a very important topic. Shabbat shalom, b'sorot tovot, yishorot